Thank you everyone for joining us this morning. I would like to start with oh, our presentation. Let's get started here. Let's see how to share screen. Okay, can everyone see that okay? All right. So welcome to our TD Academy event this morning, the Science Policy Interface for Amazon Conservation. Um, I would like to start with some general housekeeping, though I know that we are all Zoom professionals at this point, but I mostly want to emphasize that you can please post in the chat at any moment your comments and questions, and to say that we have simultaneous translation available for English to Spanish or Spanish to English. And I would like to send a special thank you to our interpreters today. Welcome to our panelists and a special welcome to, I think Marcela Ojeda, our deputy executive director from II is joining us um, all the way from Pretoria, uh, South Africa this morning where she's attending the SRI conference. Um, my name is Kim Portmas and I work in the capacity building uh, part of II where I manage the Science, Technology, and Policy STEP Fellowship Program. It is my great honor to present our moderator for this event, the wonderful Laila Sandroni. Laila is an anthropologist and geographer with experience in, actually, I'm sorry, I jumped the gun. I wanted to go through the agenda before I introduced Laila. <laughs> this is our agenda for today. I will do an introduction. These are wonderful panelists. I'm so glad to have you here. We will um, give them ample time to present each of their um, perspectives on Amazon conservation with a focus on the science policy um, interface with time in between for each of you to ask questions if there are any from the audience. And then Lila will facilitate a discussion with our panelists and the audience at the end. Before I hand it over to Lila, I would like to introduce her as one of our Science Technology Set Fellow programs. Lila is a PhD in anthropology and um, geography um, with a specialist specialty in social environmental sciences. Her research focuses on engaging in activities related to the science policy interface and her interests in, with the indigenous communities in Brazil. Her research interests lie in the field of transformations to sustainability and the role of different kinds of knowledge in defining the best paths to achieve biodiversity conservation and forest management. She has particular expertise in epistemology, power knowledge and relations, and evidence-based policy and environmental issues. As a science, technology, and policy step fellow hosted by the II, Lila works with our science director on the transdisciplinary program. <clears throat> she is one of four STEP fellows hosted by the II and forms part of the Inter-American Network of now 45 early career STEP fellows in partnership with AAAS and MyTax Canada that currently span 11 countries in the America, working and learning together on how to be agents of change in the science policy interface. Thank you, Lila. The floor is yours. Thank you so much, Kim. This was a really kind introduction. Thank you so much. So before I pass the floor on to our speakers, I'm positive that everyone is eager to hear from them. I just wanted to give our participants a little bit of context on this event and the IITD Academy. So uh, the Transdisciplinary Academy is one of the many activities held by the Inter-American Institute for Global Change Research, the IAI. And it's an intergovernmental organization that brings together 19 countries from across the Americas to address challenges of generating actionable knowledge to support our member states in mitigation and adaptation of the world's changing environment. The institution acts in capacity building and research uh, and supports strategic, strategic teams that are in our strategic plan and scientific agenda. 
such as climate change, biodiversity conservation, and renewable energy. This year, we are all really glad uh, because the IAI is celebrating uh, its 30th anniversary. So uh, the general idea of transdisciplinary knowledge was already present in the visionary agreement that was signed in 1992. But the IAI is an evolving institution and so is also its scientific agenda. So the main general idea of global change that was there in the beginning of the, the institution has developed and evolved throughout time. And through this evolving scientific agenda, we strive to, to remain up to date to the visionary uh, um, designs of the institution. The current IAI activities gravitate around three concepts, transformations, to, uh, uh, to address the transformation to sustainability. Transdisciplinary research, science policy interface, and science diplomacy. All of these concepts are connected to the process of reaching out to excellent and growing scientific capacity, capacity in the Americas and putting this knowledge to use with different sets of stakeholders. So we are talking about here from policymakers to public managers that are actually making the decisions and also the people that are affected by those decisions, uh, local communities, indigenous populations, and so on. This is the essence of transdisciplinary science, uh, to build tools and methodologies for the co-production of knowledge and generation uh, for, cap uh, for of capabilities to address real life problems. The Staff Fellowship Program and the TD Academy are IAI initiatives connected to these three concepts. The TD Academy, uh, and this event is a part of this uh, initiative, uh, provides training on the approaches and skills to advance knowledge and facilitate uh, sharing information, best practices, and promote regional dialogue. So this is uh, our main goal here, to bring together this uh, really experience with lots of uh, um, practices to share with, uh, uh, with us today uh, and bring them together to have an interesting discussion on a specific topic, Amazon conservation. Uh, the Amazon is one of the most biodiverse and uh, uh, important even in symbolic terms uh, throughout the world. So we're really glad to be here with our uh, guests. Therefore, well, without further ado, I'll pass the floor on to Dr. Avesita Shikon from the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation, IAI partner in this event. She is the program director of the Andes Amazon Initiative that aims to ensure long-term conservation on the Amazon and will tell us about the role of her institution and program in addressing this huge challenge. Dr. Visita, if you could please, before your presentation, begin by telling a, a little bit about you to us, uh, to tell us a bit about your background, your uh, current role, and also what's, what's the main issue that you're most passionate about at this moment. Thank you so much, Dr. Visita. Thank you very much, Laila, for the kind uh, introduction, and thank you, uh, I. I IAI for this uh, invitation. Um, I would like to, um, actually, um, I have a presentation and I have one slide to introduce myself. Is that okay if I start sharing? Okay, so I will share my screen. Um, please let me know if you can see it. Can you see the screen? Yes, looks great, thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, so um, people ask me how I got into conservation. Um, I grew up in Lima in Peru, and I learned uh, about conservation through the eyes of indigenous peoples. Um, I studied anthropology at the Catholic University in, in Lima. 
I worked as an undergrad with the Asian Inca people in uh, Satipo in Peru, this picture here, the first one. Then for my graduate work, I went to Bolivia and worked with Etsimane indigenous peoples. And uh, currently, um, I work for the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation as the director of the Andes Amazon Initiative. And uh, here I am with uh, our partners, Moore Foundation partners in Puerto Maldonado. Uh, we support uh, international NGOs, local NGOs, and some local um, public agencies to do conservation in the Amazon. So what I'm most worried about right now is uh, how to save the Amazon. So <laughs> I am very, I'm building coalitions to do so. So I am very pleased to be here with you all, um, distinguished uh, panelists, and also um, you all in IAI and the public to uh, build a coalition to save the Amazon together. So, um, what we do at the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation is what we call a strategic philanthropy. What that means is that uh, we put together a team of uh, professionals and um, then we write a strategy to develop grants. The Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation started in 2001. So at first, that first year we had planning grants. In 2003, we developed the strategy and the foundation approved the Andes Amazon Initiative for a limited period of time. We have had several external evaluations, as you can see here, 2007, 10, 15. We had an extension in 2017 where we included drivers because at the beginning, most of our work was only focused on protected areas, conservation areas, um, census latus, meaning protected areas and indigenous lands. In 2021, we had a final external evaluation to end the initiative. But um, because the threats in the Amazon are still there, um, deforestation and degradation still occurs due to several causes such as uh, illegal logging, illegal mining, also the expansion of uh, agriculture and cattle ranching. Um, the foundation, we presented a new proposal and the foundation um, did approve a new proposal for us to keep working in the Amazon over the next decade. So um, when we started to um, identify our areas of work, first we looked at the situation. And as we know, uh, nearly 50% of the Amazon is already under some sort of protect protection, either conservation areas or indigenous territories. Um, so this nearly 50% of the Amazon is about 408 million hectares. But we know that the, but we know that this is not enough. In order to avoid a tipping point in the Amazon, we need to conserve at least 70%, if not more, of uh, forest cover and uh, healthy ecosystems. So, so far, what we see in this graph is um, what we proposed as our um, work in over the next decade. Uh, first, we want to sustain the gains. And this is um, in this first, um, in this first uh, uh, green, light green column, you see um, protected areas, then um, indigenous lands. And the idea, no, sorry, these are indigenous lands. These are protected areas. And the idea is to continue investments to sustain the gains over here. But since this is not enough, we are proposing to add a hundred million hectares more under effective management. Um, 50 million for indigenous lands and other 50 million in other uh, hectares and other uh, type of area of um, of territories. Now that will take us to um, about 508 million hectares above the 70 percent because it is important to have a buffer anyway. So this is what we uh, are proposing to do over the next decade. So in the second phase uh, from 2022 until 2031, our vision remains the same. Um, we want to secure the biological diversity and the climate function of the Amazon. 
and the outcome is to avoid the tipping point from forest to savanna. We know because scientists have studied this very much that the tipping point is, as I said, at the 70% at least mark. There is a discussion whether it's 17 or 80, but it is in between these uh, percentages. Our uh, proposal then is to have the same vision and our initiative outcome is to secure 70% of the Amazon with four strategies. One strategy fo focused on indigenous peoples and uh, local communities that um, conserve and protect their land in collective ways. The second goal is to um, conserve the connectivity of freshwater and forest ecosystems. The third goal is to focus on the drivers of deforestation and degradation. We, we are going to support, keep supporting work to redirect and reduce the impacts of driver of, of habitat change in five countries. At the moment, we are working in Brazil, Colombia, Ecuador, Peru, and Bolivia. And uh, the focus at the moment is infrastructure, meaning um, those kind of projects that, uh, that fragment ecosystems, such as dams in um, rivers, in free flowing rivers, or uh, roads in continued forests. And the fourth goal is what we call the institutional framework or good governance. We need to ensure that the social, political, and economic vi viability and durability of the conservation outcomes are in place. And that will occur if we have a very explicit emphasis on securing uh, good governance. And that is the good institutional framework. Um, so the pri priority things, as I have hinted already, is ecological connectivity. And uh, here I'm giving a few examples, just very few examples of the partners that we have. So in Brazil, we have built a coalition with several um, donors and local stakeholders to have sustainable finance for the Network for Protected Areas, and it's called ARPA. Also, uh, we are supporting the Wildlife Conservation Society for freshwater conservation, and they in turn have built a coalition of local uh, NGOs and other stakeholders to achieve the goal, that goal. Also, we have cultural integrity and um, ISA in Brazil is one of our main partners and Gaia in Colombia. They are working with indigenous peoples and uh, um, in order to have uh, good protocols and uh, management plans to uh, conserve their territories. And also one emphasis that we have is on development and policy. An example of that is Harvard Growth Lab in Loreto, uh, IPAM also in Brazil, and the Science Panel for the Amazon. In fact, we have here today two, um, um, two authors of this um, effort. For sustainable finance for protected areas, uh, another coalition that we had it, with uh, NG international NGOs, local NGOs, and the Peruvian government is Patrimonio del Peru. So similar as ARPA, in Peru, we have something called Patrimonio del Peru, Peru's natural patrimony. And this week, actually, um, we are going to sign another effort for sustainable finance for protected area in Colombia called Herencia Colombia or Colombia Heritage. So please be aware tomorrow of the news when this is going to be signed in Bogota. And uh, well, it is important to build coalitions. Um, one of the uh, recent efforts that we have supported is a science panel for the Amazon. It is important to have um, policy that is based, policy and action that is based on science. We need to change the narrative. And um, as I said, today we have Anne Lencar and Lillian Painter as presenters, and they're also authors of the Science Panel for the Amazon. So I'm really looking forward to listening to the other panelists as um, in this session. 
Thank you very much for your attention. Um, well, we only have this decade to protect the Amazon and we cannot do it alone. We have to do it together. And I encourage all of you to um, please, um, please uh, be informed and also promote actions to protect the Amazon region and the planet. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Avesita. Uh, uh, it's really striking how the Andes Amazon Initiative has this format that really pushes a way forward because you have a really clear specific goal of protecting 70% of the Amazon or more, and then recognizing how complex this goal is and addressing this in different ends, addressing this in different countries, addressing this with different stakeholders. So thank you so much for this really comprehensive and interesting presentation. Uh, next, we have Dr. Enya Lenka from, uh, so I know the name in, of the plan in Portuguese, so, so the Amazon Environmental Research Institute, IPAM, uh, which is a partner in the Andes Amazon Initiative, as Dr. Avesita has just said. Dr. An is going to tell us about the deforestation dynamics in the Amazon and using monitoring to inform conservation policy. Dr. Ani, if you could please also tell us briefly about yourself before you begin. Tell us about your background, your current path of work, and what you're most passionate about at this point. Thank you. Thank you, Laila. Uh, thank you all. It's a pleasure to be here with Avisita, Lilian, Carlos, and uh, Vitoria. And uh, well, I'm Ani Alencar. I'm uh, currently the science director at IPOM. I'm a geographer and I, now I consider myself a fire scientist. I have been working with uh, fire issues uh, since the beginning of, uh, since I started actually at APUM 27 years ago. So it's, I, I guess I finally uh, got that as uh, the main issue that I, that I work with, but I, in fact, I have been work, worked with several other uh, uh, different issues uh, that related to the Amazon during my career at, at IPAM. So conservation issues, uh, I mean, uh, everything that, that involved maps because I, I, I'm fascinated by maps and I, I have been the map person at IPAM for since the beginning, so I, I end up, uh, how can I say, engaging in all different types of projects that it um, has been uh, developing for the last uh, almost 30 years. So I brought a presentation here. So just uh, as I, I like maps, I like to show the maps as well. Um, let me see if I, I always have, problems in, let me just, just trying to make that easier for everyone. I never see the, the screen I have to share. Okay, I think I have it. Okay, so I, I, I brought a short presentation uh, just to um, how can I say, highlight the main issues that uh, the Brazilian Amazon is going through in the past uh, uh, three to four years. So, and they are related to the hump up, uh, deforestation and fires that we, we have been facing, uh, not only in the Amazon, actually in Brazil as a whole. Um, so, as I, as I told you, I, I like uh, to, to study forest fires. And I have been um, digging myself into this theme for the, the past years. And for me, it's very impressive to see that the Amazon forest it shouldn't burn. Uh, it's a rainforest. But in fact, uh, we have 41%, a little bit more than 41% of all the areas burned 
in Brazil have burned in the Amazon. So how, how come this happens if we have uh, an area that shouldn't burn? Um, so it's in a way, it's kind of very, um, how can I say, very simple to understand. Uh, the Amazon is burning because human beings are changing the ability of the forest to hold fires and also changing the ecosystem in, as a whole. Uh, so fires is, are part of the deforestation process. Fires are also the main tool uh, used to clean and, and to, to manage pasture, which is the main land use in the Brazilian Amazon. And those uh, are directly affecting uh, the ability of the forest, the resilience of the forest to um, hold uh, and to stop fires. And so the, and this is a major problem. Uh, what we have seen is that lately, um, <clears throat> in the recent, in the three recent years, we have been an increased rate of deforestation. So Last year, in the last uh, official uh, number that we have for deforestation, uh, we have seen that, okay, we, we have reached uh, a rate that is only smaller than 2006 when we were kind of uh, reducing deforestation a lot in, the, in, the, uh, in 2006. And most of the, this deforestation is illegal. It's very important to understand where these processes are happening in order to, to uh, I mean, to attack them, to, you know, to, to fight in them. And uh, it's, it's very curious that in recent years, we have an increase in uh, deforestation and fires occurring in public lands. And this affects, for example, uh, protected areas as well. So even though indigenous territories, they represent only 3% of everything that is, has been deforested in the Amazon in the past uh, uh, cycle of, of deforestation measurement, uh, these areas, uh, these numbers were smaller before. I mean, conservation units also in, in other types of uh, protected areas such as APA, they also have been under threat and under attack. But mostly public lands and designated public forests have been the major target of um, people that are invading land and converting this land at larger patches. So these uh, numbers, they, they just show very clearly where the problem is, uh, is this, this sense of impunity that is uh, covering the entire Brazilian Amazon uh, has been uh, allowing, uh, facilitating this process of land ac acquisition in the Amazon. And you can see really clear the jump in, in, in uh, occupation and deforestation of public forests after 2018. Uh, the beginning of the, the last government. So we can see this very clearly. We also have a major increase in deforestation the first year in, from 2010 to 19 in indigenous territories. These areas have decreased in the past years, but they are also still very high and higher than they were before. We also had an increase in conservation uh, units in, in other types of uh, protected areas. So, in, in, I mean, in sum, uh, if you want to reduce uh, deforestation in the Amazon, we have to start targeting public forests because this will be a stimulus also to reduce uh, deforestation that uh, is affecting uh, uh, private properties. We know where this is happening, and, and this is the major thing. We have the best now one of the best monitoring systems in the world, official one. We have others from civil society. We, we know with precision, uh, we even have the social security number uh, kind of Brazilian type of people. Uh, and why and how come we don't, 
get this, uh, uh, we need to have political will. Um, so again, I mean, we know which protected areas are being more affected. We know which indigenous territories, we know which settlements, we know the problems, we know where they are happening. And we are still uh, not able to uh, tackle this problem. And uh, so, and, and this is what we, we have to, to, to change. The, the work with governments, state governments have been very important in this agenda, but we still need um, to do a 50-50 uh, for the Amazon, for the Brazilian Amazon. And when I say 50-50, I mean like we need to be really hard with enforcement. We need to strengthen um, uh, enforcement agencies that have been very uh, weakened uh, through this government in terms of money, in terms of people, and even in terms of, how can I say, when a, when a person wants to do their work and they are disauthorized uh, in a way. So uh, this needs to change. We have to promote and to um, re-engage the institutions in terms of articulation. Uh, they have to, to be able to talk with each other, to be able to do a be better operations, for example, to, to grab uh, illegal uh, miners, uh, illegal loggers, uh, illegal uh, land grabbers, and, and things like that. And they need to, to to have a strong, uh, how can I say, judiciary in a way, uh, to be able to really punish uh, the criminal, uh, the criminals. Um, and, and now we have something else going on in the Brazilian Amazon, which is uh, very, uh, we are very afraid of, which is the the uh, the strength of the uh, the drug uh, dealers and trafficking. Uh, and everything has been connected, and this is even more difficult to uh, fight in the future uh, if we don't have if we don't change the situation as soon as possible. So one way is to really uh, identify and block financial transactions, uh, and then to get the where the money uh, is going to to designate public lands, also to take out of the market, of the illegal market, public lands is very important. So this is the half part. The other half, we also, we, we can't uh, forget about the positive incentives. We have to go through um, uh, uh, to support forest-based economies. We have to consolidate protected areas, continue to consolidate protected areas. Economic incentives for, for private conservation are also very important. And to support smallholders and integrate them in a market, in a, in a good practices market uh, is, is uh, fundamental. Uh, we need to do that, but we need to kind of change our government in a way we need to change the direction of uh, the, the government, the Brazilian government uh, is going. And, uh, and not only in the, in the head, but also uh, uh, the Congress. I mean, we, we need to uh, be able to restore what we have lost in the past three years. So um, is that, I think is, there is no more time. Uh, Earth continues to warm. And really, like the Amazon is part of the solution, of the solution. Not only the Brazilian Amazon, the entire Amazon. Uh, and we need uh, to keep the Amazon alive. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anne. This was a, a really also quite comprehensive uh, presentation, and it really it struck me how uh, that you, the work that yourself and IPAM does really is a great example of actionable science, of transdisciplinary science, because you're generating knowledge about where the fires are going on and why they are going on. 
to address how to build better public policies, be this of the, the public management itself, but also through NGOs and other types of initiatives. So congratulations on your work and thank you for this great presentation. And this is crucial for uh, the policies to move forward. Now I will pass the floor for uh, on to our next speaker, Dr. Victoria Reyes Garcia from the Catalan Institution for Research and Advanced Studies, ICREA. She's a professor at the Environmental Science and Technology Institute of the Autonomous University of Barcelona, also an IPBS author, and she will tell us about the role of indigenous peoples and local communities, for short IPLCs, in biodiversity conservation in the Amazon, hi highlighting how they have been practically confronting activities that damage nature. So please, Dr. Victoria, if you could just, as Dr. Rani and Dr. Avesita did, tell us a little bit about yourself, your background, and what you're most passionate about at this point before you begin. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you, Laila, for the introduction. And sorry, it was a couple of minutes late. I I had I was in the wrong time zone back then, but um, uh, again I only missed like that the first uh, two minutes. So I'm an anthropologist as a visita, and I actually we we met uh, when we were both in in grad school in in Florida, and uh, but my work is mostly interdisciplinary. Uh, so uh, I often get, get um, invited to, to in the biologists uh, or ecologists meeting more than the anthropologists. And I have been working in my previous, I mean, my original, my initial work was with the Chimane also, Cabecita in the Bolivian Amazon. That's where I did my, my field work for my dissertation. And after that, I just moved to Barcelona, where is my position and my work has been most mostly global. I have worked with, I mean, with this global view rather than um, staying in, in only studying one community. And what makes me, what I mean, I'm really interested in or working on these days is um, at this intersection between how climate change and biodiversity loss affect indigenous people, because sometimes we, we look at our scientists that we like to break things to understand them. We kind of like look at impacts of climate change, of impacts of biodiversity loss, but I'm very much interested in, in how those things uh, interact and interact also with the histories and with the previous historical vulnerabilities of indigenous people in, in impacting them. And the other thing that I am really, really interested now or working now is in this um, IBES, as you say, I'm, I'm part of the IBES initiative and I'm working in the transformative change assessment. So we are trying to assess how we could transform uh, the society or values and governance for, for sustainability or for like a living planet. And this is really important and exciting to me because we usually academicians stay like in the theoretical and this is something that for me is more <laughs> practical. So I'm also, I have also prepared um, a presentation. Um, let me see if I can share it. Do you see it? And you see it now in full mood? So, um, so, no? No, it's not in full mode. Oh. Um. So, how do I... So, I have to put first in full, mo full mood and then I share? Yes. But I, but I cannot share. Um, okay. Is it okay if I share it like that? I just don't want to waste people time. If I make it big. Yes, yes, we can see it. Okay. Okay, so um, I'm going to be talking a little bit um, about this idea and, and the, what I'm going to be presenting, uh, it's, it has to do with the results of the in of the IPBS, so for those I don't know if someone is not familiar, but is this uh, platform for biodiversity and ecosystem services that brings together the scientist community 
and um, and the um, policymakers around the world and a hundred and I think uh, right now 136 countries are part of this IBES initiative and between 2016 and 19, we developed this global assessment that um, tried to, to see uh, the status of biodiversity and ecosystem services in, in the world. And one of the important points of this initiative is that it's not only based in, uh, in academics or, or research work or papers that we have published, but it also looks at other sources of uh, knowledge or other data sources, including indigenous uh, knowledge or traditional knowledge. So there is a big focus on, on indigenous people in this initiative. So one are the important, one of the, so, so what I'm going to be presenting comes from the results of the IPES and then publications that we have came out after the, the um, this um, assessment. So one of the import, very important um, findings of this uh, initiative is this is that at least 25% of the world terrestrial surface is managed uh, or own or somehow uh, still, so steward, I mean the stewards are the indigenous people, right? And to that we need to add also other forms of um, other local communities, farmers, fishers, herders, hunters, ranchers, that also manage other areas uh, of the world. And these represent some of the richest areas with the highest biodiversity in the world, right? So indigenous people and local communities are stewards of the nature that we have. And another of the fin findings of this uh, global assessment is that although nature is declining in very alarming uh, ways in all, the, in all the world, it's declining less rapidly in areas that are um, managed or owned by indigenous people. Uh, so in a, in a way, the areas that are managed or owned or yeah, by indigenous people are becoming islands of biological and cultural diversity, right? So in that sense, they are very important. So traditionally, or the discourse that we and we, we also analyze in the in the IBES is that there are there, and this is a, lot, a big focus of, of, of anthropologists and other scholars, is try to see why is that the case, right? And there is all this like literature showing that how indigenous people and local communities have developed many uh, ways in which they manage the environment and contribute to maintain biodiversity rich ecosystems, right? And this includes the domestication of species or creating new ecosystems through landscape management or enrichment of biodiversity. There are also examples of sustainable use and man management and monitoring of ecosystems, like uh, the use of fire to, not like <laughs> and, and Anne was telling us, but this, the cultural use of fire to actually prevent larger fires. This is kind of like a very well demonstrated in Australia or in on the, the, on the US. Um, there is also like a, a way of protecting um, uh, the areas where they live because they are stewards, so they, they protect against uh, loggers or against other people who want to enter. And they also have like all these different concepts and ideas. No? So this is basically the discourse that has been um, kind of like um, analyzed by anthropologists and by yeah, until now, right? But one inter interesting point that links a lot with what Avesita was saying about the need to change the narrative is that this idea, I mean, everything that I have said until now, it's kind of like well known and it's well studied, but this gives an idea of kind of like an uh, essentialized idea of like, okay, indigenous people, because they are in this paradise living in harmony with nature and they have developed those systems and it's kind of like seems idyllic and and the truth is that this is not only like the the whole picture because what we found through this research or through associated research is, is indigenous people are also actively defending nature against damaging activities. So it's not only indigenous people are developing or domesticating or, or working to enhance the environment that they are 
uh, in which they live, but they are also defending their territories and their life ways against the environmental destruction that it's bring to their territories by the extractive communities and by, I mean, the community driven development, right? So there is this publication uh, in which we are looking at uh, environmental conflicts. So environmental conflicts are defined as, as moments where, uh, where some group of people is defending nature actively, right? And we we well, we are using this database, this huge database of environmental conflicts that have more than 300, uh, 3,000, sorry, uh, conflicts around the world. And of those, most of them, like 35% involve indigenous people, right? So if we, if you, I mean, you cannot see it very much, but this publication is gonna be out very soon. But if, if you look at this graph, you probably can see better. Uh, indigenous populations represent three to 5% of the population in the, in the world, and they are involved in a lot of, uh, in 35% of the um, uh, environmental conflicts, right? Meaning that they are taking a very active role in opposing activities that damage nature in which in, in the areas where, where they live, right? And here you will also see, and this is very important, that when you look at who are these people, and I should have take out the uh, some of the groups in the Amazon, which I have not, sorry, excuse me for that. But when you look at, um, at, at these people, you see that many of the groups um, are um, endangered, culturally endangered, right? So you have uh, nature and culture endangered, and like you have the stewards of nature trying to defend, uh, the stewards of nature trying to defend nature when they are basically threatened themselves. And, and this is important to say it in that way, because it, as Abe said, you know, we need to change the narrative. The narrative is not that indigenous people are protecting because they create biodiversity by being uh, living in the, in the paradise. No, They are stewards of nature because they are defending sometimes with their lives. And in the Amazon, we have like a very sad case uh, in the past weeks, right? And it's not only indigenous people, it's also their actors, but but environmental defenders are kind of like defending nature with, with their own life. And this has to be uh, said in a way in which it's not romanticized, right? And, and just to, to, to make this point stronger in this same atlas where we did an, there was an analysis, this is already published in Global Environmental Change, of the environmental of these environmental conflicts in, in at that moment it was uh, only 2700 i mean less uh, a smaller sample but there were uh, about 2000 people assassinations that have occurred in in the whole um, world through uh, of people who were defending um, their their lands right and many of them has to do with mining, you know, mining companies and biomass and land use and even in conservation cases, right? So this is, and in the case for indigenous people, this was kind of, I think it was where than here, 40% you know, of the case of the cases um, in Wales, there were assassinations involved some indigenous groups or traditional communities. It doesn't mean that the indigenous there was a person, indigenous person dying, but that there were uh, conflicts in which indigenous uh, people were, were involved. So, um, so this was, I mean, I wanted to bring that because um, sometimes when we talk about the role of indigenous people, we just focus in this other part, which is very important, no? how they have maintained biodiversity, but now, in in the in the in the current situation, as we said, no, that Anne, Anne was telling us about all these fires, how they are facilitating the process of land acquisition, the the knowledge of where are the fires and who is doing are there, but there is no uh, policy, uh, government, no political will to actually act against that, no. So in many of these cases, this is kind of like a, a similar situation. So just to wrap it up. And um, when we, as, as, as a part of this um, 
IBES assessment when we're looking at what is the um, role or what has been the, the main contributions of indigenous people and local communities to conservation in general, we were think we were or we just kind of like articulated around four axes, right? One is this first axis of knowledge, right? And this is the one where most of the conservation um friendly to indigenous people have focus, right? So, you know, indigenous people have knowledge that can be used in conservation action. They know some ways that can be important to co-produce knowledge. Um, and this is true, right? So, but this is only one of the axes, right? The other axe that it's very important and that it's starting to gain arena, but it's still kind of like not so strong, but it's growing, is this idea that indigenous people also have not only knowledge, but they also have conceptualizations of nature and uh, that are in line to the, I mean, in this case, the conservation biodiversity vision no, of living in harmony with nature, right? So we cannot only, it's not only that we need to learn about their knowledge, but also about how they conceptualize, conceptualize nature, nature, no? So the idea that um, nature has rights, nature has agency that in many indigenous groups is kind of like um, represented through, through spiritual, uh, learnings, that's something that we could also learn from, right? The third axis, and this could help in, in reframing conservation action. So the third, and the third axis uh, is, uh, which is also something that we have talked here, and it's, uh, is this idea that you need to, per the participation of indigenous people, uh, because promoting participation makes uh, governance more inclusive, and then you will have better uh, conservation con conservation actions, right? But the last uh, acts that we highlight here is also this issue of rights, right? Indigenous people have, I mean, access to to their lands or to, is is kind of like recognized by United Nations declarations, right? So not doing it is going again, not, not recognizing the right nor giving them the, uh, the, the right to decide what to do with their lands, whether a company exploitation, oil exploitation is going to happen in their lands or not. All this is again is, is a viola violation of human rights, right? And unless we put it with these words, uh, it's kind of like um, not giving the, the full picture. So, so to make effective and legitimate conservation action, you need to work through all these four axes, or this is what we propose. And with that, I leave it here. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Victoria, and uh, thank you especially for making that point that indigenous populations are not just there living in harmony with the the na with nature and developing uh, nature's biodiversity, but also struggling actively against uh, the processes of deforestation that were shown uh, by our speakers here today and showing that with real empirical data on it and uh, giving a complete picture of how big the problem is. So thank you so much for that. And next we have um, Dr. Lillian uh, and she will also make a complimentary um, presentation on the one that was just given by Dr. Victoria. She is the director of the Wildlife Conservation Society Bolivia, Dr. Lillian Painter, uh, and it's a global institution dedicated to wildlife and landscape conservation uh, that works in Bolivia since the 70s. Uh, and she's also talking about the role of indigenous peoples and protected areas uh, to provide partnerships to uh, uh, landscape conservation. Uh, please, Dr. Lillian, if you could please also, before you talk about uh, your work, to talk about your background, your current path, and the main issue that you're most passionate about at this point. Okay, thank you. Can you hear me? Yeah? Okay. Yes, perfectly. Um, 
Okay, thank you very much uh, for the invitation. So um, I'm, I'm the country director for the Wildlife Conservation Society. I'm originally uh, an ecologist, um, but uh, now uh, uh, a conservation uh, practitioner um, um, working on um, landscape, landscape, landscape conservation with a um, multidisciplinary uh, team and uh, numerous uh, partnerships. And um, the thing that is that I'm most excited about um, at the moment is um, a, um, figuring out a, how um, to achieve a long lasting conservation impact in protected areas, but also in indigenous uh, territories and how to um, uh, involve um, um, uh, indigenous people more actively as, as, as leaders of uh, conservation actions, including um, the role of young um, indigenous uh, people as, uh, um, as uh, technical uh, leaders that can bring together um, both the science and the um, and their uh, traditional knowledge um, to achieve um, more um, impactful interventions. Um, so uh, I'm without uh, further ado and uh, thanking you the, the, all the all the other um, presentations that were very um, that were very uh, um, inspiring and uh, relevant to the to the work um, that um, that we're doing in um, in Madidi. Um, uh, so I'm going to talk very briefly about the importance of indigenous lands and then give you a little bit of the historic history of our um, activities um, in this landscape and how they have developed in, in depth in terms of the, the work that we do with indigenous people and some of the um, things that we're looking towards in the, in, in the future. I, okay. Um, so well, as um, we've we've heard in the in the previous presentations, indigenous lands in the Amazon are very are are very important, and we won't be able to prevent the tipping point without protected areas and indigenous uh, and indigenous lands. Um, indigenous lands also frequently are found neighboring protected areas, and they um, permit. Um, uh, approaches to maintain connectivity uh, um, that is important um, for terrestrial ecosystems, but of course also for um, aquatic um, um, connectivity. Also um, altitudinal connectivity, which is critical to maintain um, resilience in the face of, of climate change. And um, of course, um, maintaining um, a, large expanses of, of um, a forest ecosystems in good uh, conservation status that are critical for wide ranging species like jaguar, but also for to maintain the hydrological cycle and um, avoid the, the tipping point and for global um, a, as a response to the global uh, climate change. Um, we began work, WCS began work in the, in the Madidi um, area uh, um, a very long time ago in 1999. And initially we approached um, uh, the, 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 the work through a very traditional um, vision of focusing on a specific species and understanding the, the conservation status and ecology of um, the spectacled bear, working in an area the size, um, more or less the size of New Hampshire. Um, and, uh, but as we began more to be more familiar with this uh, landscape, we saw that towards the east, um, there were uh, there was um, increasing deforestation along um, the San Buenaventura to Ixiamas Road, and um, a, we um, engaged with the Takana people to figure out what we could do along that area for wildlife conservation. And a, our initial uh, approach was working um, to benefit indigenous people. 
um, supporting their efforts for um, a sustainable management of their subsistence hunting. And they uh, soon um, told us that um, they were interested in maintaining uh, sustainability of their subsistence hunting, but what use was it if they sustainably managed their, their, their hunting if they weren't owners of their, of their land? So that moved us to a process of working in partnership with indigenous people to support their efforts to uh, secure their territorial rights and establish their um, uh, life plans, their, their territorial plans for their collective territory once it was titled. And um, there it, we began a process of, of um, really um, um, of growth of the of the program of conceptual growth uh, of the program thanks to the dialogue with visionary leaders like uh, Neide Cartagena and uh, Celine Quenevo. And currently, we are now working in an area the size of Greece. Uh, if we can, if we also um, um, uh, um, consider the areas in Peru that, um, of course, that's uh, under the, the WCS program in Peru, but it's a much larger landscape involving numerous indigenous territories, municipal protected areas, and uh, national protected areas. And of course, working at that, at that landscape is what, at that size of area, is really what is necessary to respond to um, the biological importance of this, of this area, the connectivity needs, the ecological connectivity needs, but also to respond to the numerous threats arising from infrastructure and uh, legal and illegal um, natural resource extraction activities. Um, as a result of the work with um, uh, with the indigenous people and the and the protected areas, we we've been able to document that uh, deforestation rates um, within the protected areas and indigenous territories, when considering the distance um, from roads, are very are very similar. So indigenous people, although as was mentioned in the previous presentations the rates of deforestations have also increased uh, recently, but um, indigenous territorial um, management visions are compatible with maintaining um, a forest cover. Um, this approach at a, a landscape level, maintaining connectivity between protected areas and indigenous territories has also been effective in um, allowing the recovery um, of wildlife species, uh, for example, um, for, for jaguar, now maintaining one of the stronghold, most important stronghold populations in the Amazon. It is also uh, the work with indigenous people through the implementation of their life plans has also increased um, local uh, livelihoods and gradually is improving um, the participation of, um, of women. Um, as a result, um, this landscape where we're working uh, is 95% of this landscape is still uh, maintaining um, the original um, ecosystem uh, cover. And uh, but now, um, you know, in, in, in all these in all these years, the relation between um, a between uh, conservation organizations and indigenous um, organizations, I think, is in a very exciting um, a time of, of change of, of um, through the, the greater capacity of, of the indigenous territorial organization and their demands for um, a autonomy um, we are now moving to uh, to um, we have now moved really to uh, a vision of conservation by indigenous people, and uh, this approach uh, is um, being implemented through a series of ten steps that we present represent in this drawing as a river because the ten steps are not linear. You know, they the, the, as the river they meander, they meet again. They can be revisited, uh, re-evaluated, and implemented in different order uh, of, of implementation depending on the specific circumstances of the, of the indigenous um, uh, territory. But um, this uh, slide presents the 10, the ten steps, uh, territorial rights over territor their territories, 
organizational strengthening and leadership, development of indigenous territorial plans, zoning processes, natural resource rules and regulations, implementation of natural resource management uh, projects, territorial control and vigilance, um, capacity building for administration, sustainable funding mechanisms, and capacity building for monitoring and research. And uh, we think that by uh, documenting and identifying uh, indicators of the implementation of those steps, in addition to um, documenting the governance strengthening, the, the, the governance capacity of the indigenous uh, organizations, um, indigenous people will be able to engage um, through clear uh, um, metrics, self-defined uh, metrics to show the impact over, um, over um, the, slowing down deforestation or preventing deforestation, defending nature, but also implementing their territorial um, management visions and developing their governance capacity and engage with sustainable finance mechanisms through the definition of indicators of all these of all these steps, um, and uh, um, that's what we're we're working towards in order to support um, our our partners to um, obtain the support that they require to uh, to um, uh, to uh, defend their lands and to maintain the benefits of um, that their territories present for themselves, for their, for their maintenance of their culture, but also to respond to the three global crises of climate change, biodiversity loss, and global pandemics. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Lillian. Uh, and I believe that your presentation really composes really well this panel also by showing how a territorially based experience can share best practices about how to apply and engage with the local populations and how the practice of generating knowledge and solutions with the demands of those local, local and indigenous populations is really a key aspect of moving forward with an agenda for biodiversity conservation in the Amazon. So thank you so much for your presentation. So last but not least, we have Dr. Carlos Jolie from um, the State Campinas University and my mentor of the project Biota of FAPESP uh, that's dedicated to research in characteristics, conservation and sustainable use of biodiversity. He's going to tell us about his vision for a new research agenda for Amazon conservation. Dr. Carlos, if you could please uh, tell us a little bit about yourself as well, your current state of events, and uh, the main issue that you're most passionate about at this point. Well, uh, thank you, uh, Lila and uh, Kim, for the invitation to participate in this uh, uh, webinar. Uh, I'm a biologist uh, by training, uh, uh, teaching at the State University of Campinas uh, plant ecology for almost 45 years. Uh, and here I'm representing the scientific director of the State of Sao Paulo Research Foundation, FAPESP. Uh, and the passion I think I am with is uh, to sit in small uh, waterfalls in the Atlantic forest with my grandchildren watching birds and monkeys and other animals if you're lucky and knowing that a little bit of that I've helped to preserve. So that's that's the, the thing that I'm passionate now. Uh, my grandchildren are two and four years old so uh, they enjoy a lot uh, being with the granddad. Well, uh, I'm, I haven't made a presentation for today because uh, what I'm going to present is uh, a work in progress. Uh, it's something that we still not uh, completely uh, finalized, but it's an idea that we started to discuss at uh, FAPESP 
almost uh, two years ago, uh, sort of looking at the large research projects that have been developed in the Amazon, like the large biosphere atmosphere interaction uh, LBA that was uh, fantastic to discover and to study all the chemistry, the physics of the atmosphere and all the fluxes and how the rain moves from the sea inland and then uh, towards the uh, southern uh, parts of uh, Brazil and how important this is for the regional climate. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, it didn't help uh, to solve the problem of the people that are living in the Amazon and we have to think that we have about 25 million residents living in the Amazon. If we consider the whole region, all the countries, this comes up to 30 million people living in the forest. Uh, and uh, I was in the conflict of uh, destroying the forest for uh, a very immediate uh, gain uh, or preserving the forest and developing uh, uh, sustainable activities uh, for a, a longer term, like uh, some of the uh, uh, traditional populations and indigenous people uh, have been doing for uh, the last centuries. But uh, what we wanted to change uh, and using the experience we had in the Biota program to get the other research programs of the past involved. The past has a climate change research program, has a program on uh, bioenergy, and has an e-science program. Uh, so we didn't want to get uh, the biological understanding of the Amazon, although we still need a lot of research on that. Obviously, we made a lot of progress. We know a lot about the species that are there, but uh, we need to know more. That's it. It's enormous the biodiversity that we have there. But to try to uh, join this uh, development of knowledge uh, with an approach uh, that would take into account, that would uh, involve uh, different stakeholders, uh, indigenous people, uh, traditional knowledge, uh, politicians, uh, academia, uh, NGOs. So co-construct a project where we were looking at the same time to the advance of knowledge, but also uh, finding solutions. So a solution oriented problem. And solution by that, we mean, how can you, you improve the standard of living of the Amazon population uh, with the forest there, using the forest as uh, the main asset. So as I said, we started to discuss this uh, two years uh, ago. Uh, uh, there is a lot of uh, uh, progress on that discussion. Uh, we uh, managed to organize a side event uh, on the last meeting and the 10th meeting, annual meeting of the G, uh, GRC. Uh, we've got other uh, uh, large research supporters interested in uh, this uh, approach. And uh, we will start that with uh, what we've called a school of advanced science. This is going to happen in November. It's focused on young researchers, people that have finished their PhD in the last uh, five to seven years. We are also going to accept the students that are in their last year of their PhD uh, for an intensive two weeks course uh, with people from all the Amazonian countries, hearing the different approaches to the problems and different solutions that were used. We have a lot of local solutions. We have excellent example of uh, fish management in Mamirawa. We have excellent examples of uh, uh, Guarana uh, management in uh, other regions, uh, other parts of the Amazon. Uh, the same with uh, the Kupuasu. Uh, perhaps the only one that strikes out is acai that became a major commodity in the, uh, uh, all countries in the world know what acai is, but now it's becoming a problem because it's being 
super exploited and the exploitation is distracting other uh, species uh, to, to harvest the SIE. So everything we have, it works very well on small scales, but we, we cannot increase that. Whenever we try to increase, uh, we, we have to we face it problems. So we want to, to put all this, this uh, different knowledge systems together and uh, train these uh, young people uh, on the problems, on the solutions. And uh, the aim of the, the whole story is for them to help us trace a research agenda that will come with ideas of projects that could be uh, supported not only by FAPESPI, but on the political side, FAPESPI also working with the other uh, regional or state uh, foundations uh, in, this, in Brazil. And, and we are getting sort of all the, the local, the state foundation from Amazonas, the state foundation from Pará, the market and so on. They will all participate, they've been participating in the discussions right from the beginning. And also all the countries uh, that uh, embraces the Amazon. So we, we are talking to uh, the CONICET in Peru, we are talking to uh, the Humboldt and Inchi Institute in uh, Colombia. So we are trying to, to, to bring together the knowledge available in the basin. We had an enormous, start, enormous contribution with the development of the uh, synthesis that was produced uh, last year, uh, the Amazon we want, uh, that, that brings a lot of the research that has been done. Uh, and this will be a, a, a fantastic start, but we want to, to, to go further. So uh, the idea of, of uh, presenting here uh, and of accepted invitation, because we want to hear different stories. And uh, I've, I've heard here from, from the, 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 the Moore Foundation that I didn't uh, know so well. I, 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 uh, we had some support to the Rede Latino Americana de Botanica hace uh, uh, muchos años uh, from, from, the, from the Moore Foundation, but uh, then we lost contact. Uh, Ernie Alencar is one of the persons that will be here in November teaching uh, in the school. So uh, bring together and hear uh, all the contributions you you can make uh, that we can use to improve this. Obviously, we are not going to get it right from the beginning. It's going to be a learning process. Uh, it, we, we've managed to have one very good example in the Biota program. That is a project that is being developed in the Valley do Paraíba do Sul that involves uh, forest restoration and payment for uh, environmental services. That is going very well. We've got the, 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 the small farmers uh, deeply involved with the activities and has been running for two years. And it was developed, the whole idea was developed with them. So, uh, and uh, we are not only training on biology, but we are also training them, for instance, on administration, how they can create an association, how this works, how is the bureaucracy of all these things because they, they, they need uh, to sell their product and to sell their product, they need to be registered and they need to have uh, some, some uh, licenses to do it. Uh, we are also uh, training them in, 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 in the different techniques on um, uh, management, fire management. Uh, uh, the Atlantic forest is less uh, subjected to fire, but still is, is a problem because the forest is, is dry. Uh, in the in the margins, uh, so we want to use that and get the other programs involved. It's not been easy. Uh, researchers are very much locked in a box. They don't want to. They don't want to move out from their comfort zone. Uh, but uh, after two years, I think we managed to to push them a few centimeters out, and we are starting to have uh, sort of. A better vision of what's possible to, to be done. So this is that's what we are calling the new research uh, agenda because it's an agenda that will be constructed together on, on, on using the principles of uh, transdisciplinary approach. That's something that I've learned a lot 
uh, being a member of the council of INI for six years. That's what I had to say today, Lila, and I'm open for questions from other panelists and also from the public. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Carlos. So we have really little time for a Q&A session, but I, I didn't have the nerve to interrupt any of you because I was so <laughs> tuned to everything that you were saying in such rich presentations. And I think it was worth it to take the time to discuss this in uh, the deepest way that we could. Uh, but I'd like to, to just... Um, uh, have at least some of the comments from the audience and uh, share some questions uh, in the remaining time that we have. Uh, so uh, one thing that uh, comes out of the, the whole panel is that we have a really good amount of knowledge about the Amazon and about what drives deforestation in the Amazon and about how and um, who uh, are the, the protectors of the forest and how these people are working towards that. Uh, so the main thing here would be how to make this knowledge be of use to recognize possible action paths. So I think uh, the, the last presentation by Dr. Carlos and the recogni recognition of the need for a new research agenda that takes transdisciplinarity into account is a, a perfect ending and closing for the, the whole panel. So uh, I'd like just to pose uh, to, to the panelists uh, one question that was uh, popped up in the, in the chat uh, during the event. And then, uh, if possible, ask for you to give your closing remarks uh, based on the idea, what do you see as the main opportunities and challenges for generating this transdisciplinary new research agenda uh, in, the, in the face of the, the, the propositions and the knowledge that you shared with us? So the question that popped into the, to, to the chat was from Dr. And Teresa Birthright from Jamaica to Dr. Anelenka from Ipan. Uh, she says, the livelihoods of those involved in pasture livestock agriculture in the Amazon have been engaged in conservation or possibly shifting to alternative livelihoods, such as the suggested for based economics. So the ones that are uh, implementing cattle in the Amazon are there sustainable alternatives for it. Please, Dr. Ang. Yeah, well, I think it's, uh, it'll be great if we think uh, an Amazon without cattle ranching, but I, I don't think it's gonna be possible. However, I think it's possible to invest in diversity, diversity of economic activities, in which a good pra uh, cattle ranching uh, done with good practices in, er in areas that were already opened uh, doing in an intensified way uh, and part of a system of uh, uh, agriculture in a way system uh, that includes the forestry uh, I think it will be the way to go for the Amazon and uh, of course it, it's difficult to think about this for larger producers but we have uh, hundreds and thousands of smallholders in the Amazon that, uh, that need this diversity in terms of production to be able to be uh, resilient, economically resilient. So, um, so in, for them, sure, I mean, we have to, to invest in forest-based economies together with agriculture uh, and cattle ranching economies that integrate them uh, in a way they can increase their uh, income and reduce the pressure over the forest. And, and this is possible. We did this before, but we need to have investments in, of uh, public policy mainly for smallholders. And we have to have engagement of private, uh, private uh, how can I say, companies and stakeholders as well. Uh, mostly in this, and this new uh, era era of bioeconomy that we need to be careful, but uh, 
it, it is a way also to to bring resources uh, to uh, smallholders in the Amazon. So uh, in a way, I I think I don't think it'll be it, it, we will have a shift completely to uh, forest-based economies, but I think they need to be strengthened and in, in, in order to at least be equal uh, to the economies that we have now, that, which are uh, monoculture-based. <laughs> in a way. Kim, do we have the time like to go over for five minutes just to give each of the speakers two minutes to wrap up with the question about the, the new research agenda? I would, I would love to say yes, but there's such a great question here from Andrea Chavez and I, I do want to give the audience a oh, chance yeah. um, to participate. Oh. So if we could integrate that instead, Laila, I think that would be wonderful. Okay, thank you, Kim. Uh, so Andrea Chavez says, to change the science policy narrative, change the direction of the decision makers and ultimately avoid tipping points, it seems crucial to address how scientists communicate and reach the right leaders willing to make the changes. At the same time, the protagonists of the forest biodiversity conservation actions need to be brought to the table to hear their voices. So how can we ensure the scientists co-design, co-produce and co-share science in a knowledge system and transformative communication format and action oriented at the policy level? So uh, this question by Andrea actually does summarize <laughs> everything and puts to the table uh, the general ideas of transdisciplinary science of how to communicate, how to engage with diverse sets of stakeholders and bring to the table the ones that are most important. And so I think by answering this question, each of our panelists could uh, address the issue of how we can move forward with a scientific research agenda as well, uh, a transdisciplinary one that can bring up a solution-oriented knowledge. So if we could start from the other way around, uh, Dr. Carlos, would you care to start? So I'll, I'll just mention that we are over the top, so it would be just a two minutes closing remarks by each of you. Well, I think that the first, the first point I would make is that we cannot ensure uh, that the researchers will do, will co-produce or will uh, work in a way that uh, their uh, results can be used for improving policies and so on. The only thing we can show is the advantage of doing that, that you are not only doing your own research, what, what interests you, but you're moving out a little bit of your box, but the contribution you are giving is much bigger than having a list of publications. Uh, and I think this is the, is the only way that we can uh, uh, convince them to participate in this uh, different way of doing research. Thank you, Dr. Carlos. Dr. Lilian, please. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, I think uh, a listening, you know, <laughs> engaging with the right uh, level of, of um, legitimate organizations and respecting other knowledge uh, systems is, uh, is, a, is, a great, uh, is a great start. And just bringing, bringing uh, Western uh, researchers to discuss the questions, develop the questions, develop the methodologies together with indigenous uh, researchers is a very enriching, enriching uh, process um, that um, improves the capacity to identify ways to implement uh, actions in response to that, uh, to, 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 the, to, the, to the research. And also, I would say, you know, listening <laughs> listening and and respecting is a good way to start thank you so much point well taken dr vitaria Reyes garcia por favor yeah yeah so thank you i mean that's a great question we probably none of us has the answer otherwise we'll be here right we'll be like solving the issues uh, i think 
th there has been some attempts in the IBES uh, platform uh, e to start bringing other knowledge systems to how we do science and uh, into this science and policy interface. And one of the things that as Lillian was saying is the building this dialogue, right? So not starting with, with with like, okay, that's what we want, or this is how we envision, but actually like starting from the beginning in, with a dialogue. And it's just very hard, right? Because the visions of the, of the way we communicate and for scientists is very difficult when some indigenous people say, I had a dream and the snake told me, this is very difficult to integrate in a word. And for them it's very difficult to integrate when you say, oh, the regression shows, right? So, so this dialogue is not evident, but we just have to try and we just have to be more sensible to, to, to accept that the way they express is different and that we might learn also from those because try to see what's the value behind, no? not only the, the actual facts, but what is the value behind those things? And I think that's something that can unite scientists, the civil society and and policymakers know the value for nature and the value for a safe planet. So, yeah. Thank you, Dr. Victoria. Just to clarify to the public that Dr. Avesita had to take a plane, a plane to Colombia. So she had to leave and she apologizes. And I really do uh, encourage uh, William Farfan Rios from Peru to follow up the conversation with her. Uh, so to close up, please, Dr. Rani, would you share your thoughts on this issue? Sorry, I'm awesome. <laughs> this is what we heard, the entire pandemic. Uh, uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, I think the, this uh, issue of uh, transdisciplinary and how to, I mean, um, how to engage scientists in, in actually uh, connecting more with with policies in, in, in um, it's it's a difficult issue, isn't it? In a way, we, even though we all want that and we work for it, uh, it's still there's a, a lack of almost translation. Uh, that need to be done. And that's why like these processes that engage different stakeholders are, are, are really important. Um, I think uh, as more as we have like forest people uh, interacting with scientists, with, uh, with practitioners, uh, uh, better we get to the word out to society and, and, and better we have the chance to engage also with government, uh, with government, because society is the, is, uh, has this power that we, we, we don't know it yet, but I mean, we, sh we should know better in, in fact, but we have the power of vote. And, uh, and, uh, this is a, a very important power and is a mass power. So um, I think uh, like knowledge sharing through different systems, including academic, including traditional, including to general society, something that we have to pursue. And, and this is fundamental to engage society in actually having better how can I say representatives to engage in, in better policies in the future? Thank you so much, Dr. Rani. So yes, uh, it's not easy. We can't make anyone do it because uh, we we only can show the benefits of doing it. We have to listen more. It's important to recognize that there will be challenges anyway. And co-designing by the beginning is a really important process. So this is a really interesting and so profound conversation. And I really do hope that we can continue this conversation further down the line. 
As was said in the beginning, this is a process in motion and was mentioned also by Dr. Carlos in his line. Uh, this is a process that we have to keep building bit, brick by brick. And I'm really glad that we brought this, this group of people together to put another brick on, on that specific wall of transdisciplinarity. So thank you so much for, every, uh, for everybody for coming. Kim, you want to say some final remarks before we close down? No, I just would like to reiterate, thank you everyone. Thank you to all the attendees who were able to join us today. Um, we look forward to continuing this dialogue with these wonderful panelists. Thank you so much for your time and uh, best of luck in each of your areas of passion at this moment. <laughs> Keep up the good work. Thank you, Lila, for an excellent job moderating as well. Thank you all. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. -bye. Thank you.